Welcome back to Gunday Morning Quarterback. Today we're going to talk pure, concentrated, unfiltered machine gun theory for the modern Minuteman. Today we're going to talk about machine gun theory as it pertains to the Minuteman or just a Minuteman perspective. So uh, we'll just go ahead and get into it. As I said, this is very concentrated. This may appear to most to be a pen. If you know what this actually is, go ahead and comment in the comments below and let me know. So what gear do we need? It all starts off with a machine gun or a gun close to a machine gun. Now I'm making a separate video about civilian owned machine guns, how to legally get a machine gun versus other options versus simulated full auto and really getting as close to that line as possible while still remaining legal, even though we shouldn't have to based on the second amendment and what our founding fathers intended, that's where we're at right now. In all reality, one of these semi-auto, could be upgraded in certain ways to achieve a near full auto experience. So in theory and Minecraft, you're gonna have your upgraded modern rifle, which you can upgrade in several different ways. And you're gonna be using that in conjunction with the team to set up things like a Minecraft ambush. And that will allow you to liberate and acquire a true machine gun. You're also obviously gonna need a sling, even if you're not worried about retention, which you should be, uh, you're going to be carrying your firearm, no matter what it is, for an extended distance, and it sucks just to carry it. You're going to need a magnified optic, which I happen to have an LPBO, but by quality LPBO. This is a Razor Gen 2, 1 to 6. I chose an LPBO, which is heavy, but I like the option to zoom out, to zoom in. If you're going LPBO, make sure you get a good one. The other route would be an ACOG with a piggybacked red dot on it. Um, probably like a 4X would be what I chose with a green horseshoe reticle. An IR light and laser would be vital as well because there's not always going to be daytime activities. You'll also need magazines as well as ammo to fill those magazines. And for the machine gunner role, you're going to need at least bare minimum 800 rounds. You don't have to carry all that by yourself, but it, you gotta carry a big chunk of it by yourself because what if the other guy that's helping you carry it goes down and you're not anywhere close to him? That would suck. So you wanna carry a lot of ammo with you, especially if your job is machine gunner, which we'll get into the roles and everything, but very important to have enough ammo. I mean, that's the entire purpose of a machine gun is to lay down a lot of fire. You're gonna need a spare barrel or you could, as a Minuteman, get by with a, just a spare firearm uh, as a possibility. No matter which way you go, make sure you look up some meltdown videos for your particular manufacturer and model of AR. There's some that will pop the gas tube around 400 rounds. And in, the, in that case, you could replace the gas tube and just go with a higher quality gas tube to begin with. If you do have a machine gun, have a spare barrel and bring that with you. A tripod is ideal, but a bipod would be kind of a minimal pod that you would need. Uh, just the way the machine guns function, we'll talk about it, but uh, the stability of a tripod really helps the machine gun be efficient. You're probably also going to want to bring a multi-tool or whatever tools you would need for an actual machine gun, as well as some gun lube. Alright, so just a quick review on ballistics. 
we have a line of sight, which is represented by that dotted line on there. We're looking through our optic, we're looking through our iron sights, but we have a straight line that we can see out of. Now the barrel or the bore is also a straight line. However, we have to make our point of aim coincide with our point of impact. And to do that, we, got a, we set a crossover point, which is called the zero. So if we were to fire a round out it's not going to continue on perfectly straight as the line of sight does be because of gravity mainly. Um, it's basically going to arc a little bit. So that means for every zero that you set, there's going to be a second zero as well. As that round hits and then crosses over that line of sight, peaks, it's going to come back down and once again cross over that line of sight on the back end or the way down. So it's going to look something kind of like this. And that's exaggerated, but that's just as a recap. The bullet will then rise above the line of sight, creating the shape of a half circle as it meets the same impact point at a farther distance. This is known as bullet trajectory. After reaching the second zeroing point, gravity pulls the bullet from the line of sight. So the cone of fire is basically the spread that starts to occur from your machine gun. So every single round is not going to go into the same spot. So if you were to fire it over and over and over again, it's not going to just be all through that same hole. If you were to have a piece of paper set up here, it's not always going to go through the very same hole when you shoot that piece of paper. Why? Because there's differences in each round that you fire. There could be a granule of difference in gunpowder between two different rounds. The actual lead itself could have a slight deformity to it. Wind will affect it. Humidity will affect it. Uh, but most importantly, the harmonics of the firearm is going to affect it. And what the harmonics are, are the really the vibrations from that explosion. When that firing pin hits that primer and then that primer detonates your gunpowder, it's a shock to that machine system that you have. And that starts that vibration process known as harmonics. And so if you've never seen a barrel whip, that's part of the harmonics. And uh, it's really incredible how much the barrel will fluctuate. And that is part of the reason of why we have a cone of fire. So uh, as we aim at the exact same spot, even if we stay perfectly lined up, we have perfect trigger pull. Everything's, everything's perfect. We're not going to hit that same hole over and over again. We're going to hit slightly off, slightly off, slightly off. And then as that range gets further, that cone is going to actually open up even more. And so it becomes a cone. Now the beaten zone is extremely important for the machine gunner to know. That is essentially where your rounds are landing and hitting. It's a, I call it an oval, but technically it's more of a ellipse, but it's long and narrow. That beaten zone is where about 85% of your rounds will land within. So that's kind of the pattern that a machine gun is going to have if I were shooting from back here. That's the pattern that would happen on the ground, of course. And I'll show you some video that is slightly superior to my drawings here. But that is, kind of, that is a general idea of the shape of what your beaten zone or your pattern on the ground is going to look like with the majority of the rounds that land. Now this translates also into you being able to target an area instead of just a individual. It's really a game of averages, but most rounds are going to end up here kind of in the middle and then the further out we get kind of the more sparse the rounds are. If you fire onto an incline it makes a shorter beaten zone, so it's more like that. If you fire onto a decline it makes the zone that much longer. So it would be something like that. So. This will be just kind of flat ground, incline, decline, which makes sense. 
Each bullet follows a slightly different path. The bullets form a pattern known as the cone of fire, which is oval in shape, with the majority of shots concentrated in the center. When they strike flat ground, they form a horizontal pattern called the beaten zone. Now, as I said, the beaten zone is very important to know because it is the machine gunner's pattern. The whole key and idea about this is to maximize your efficiency as a machine gunner. So if you could, you would want to kind of set it up so that those enemies kind of fall into that advantageous line. Maximum ordinate, which we talked about a second ago, but that is going to be just the peak of that trajectory. So right up there is going to be your max ordinate. Grazing fire is basically when your fire doesn't really travel over three feet or a yard off the ground. So you're just grazing the ground, which makes sense. Conversely, plunging fire is, if you've ever seen movies where they shoot like a bunch of arrows up in the air and they'll kind of rain down, you have to rely on that plunging effect to get those rounds over to that target because of things like gravity. Since with plunging fire, the rounds arc up and they're not grazing against the ground the entire time, there actually is created a zone where you can safely fire over your own guys. You can't hit them with the rounds because they're past a certain distance and your rounds are arcing over them and landing on the enemies. As a Minuteman, that probably wouldn't be us. I think we'd be more of a shifting fire over variety, but if you practice it and you become comfortable with it and your team's good with it, it's an option. So with Enfilade, we have that long axis and if we can manage to coincide the enemy's long axis with our long axis of our beaten zone, that's ideal. So if you were to take advantage of them heading in our direction, that would be how you do it because our long axis of that beaten zone is just like their long axis of their column. Their formation could be filed due to a natural funnel, but that's the way that a machine gun best takes advantage. Now defilade is essentially the opposite. It's more of a defensive position. You are protected or you are shielded, whether by terrain or by obstacles or by some sort of natural formation rocks. If that enemy is shielded behind cover, then, and especially if they're fanned out like this from side to side, they're not coinciding with that long axis. They're more coinciding with our wide axis and they are behind cover, that's defilade. Now defilade on your part is good and means not being lined up or out in the open to be plowed by the enemy. You want to be in defilade and you want your enemy to be in enfilade, if that makes sense. In this situation we've got, we've got our friendly units coming out of this wood line and they're in a file position, file formation because it's just so thick. They are set up in enfilade fire where the fire is going down their line, just like that. So the fire goes down the line. It's a very vulnerable position to be in because naturally the fire can just rip through and kill everybody with a few rounds going through it. Deflade, on the other hand, is set up laterally to enemy's fire, typically behind cover. So defilade is where you want to be. Enfilade is where you want to keep the enemy. Now, in respect to target, we have the frontal, the flanking, the oblique, and the defilade. So I'll show you an image for this that will probably help better than I can draw. Now, the trick seems to be getting that position to where you take advantage of natural funnels, natural obstacles, man-made obstacles. Now, beware if you're out in the middle of nowhere in the woods and there's a bunch of trees cut off obviously funneling whoever walks through there into a certain area, their spidey senses are probably gonna tingle. Even if we don't know sills where we stop, look, listen, and smell, they're gonna experience all of those things by that obvious trap that you've set. So be smart about it, try to use natural funnels, know that the better guys out there, the better trained, are not gonna take that easiest path like humans and animals like to take. We want that path of least resistance, so we stick to the dry creek beds and we stay out of the thick underbrush. 
Now we talked about zero earlier when we said you're gonna have two zeros. I personally like the 50 and 200 yard zero for my AR, but for a machine gun, it's gotta be a little bit different. Uh, their range is gonna be further out. So for a 5.56, five, if you have a 16 inch barrel, you're scraping by to get 600 yards. If you have a 240 Lima, you're gonna be much further than that. You can get out as far as a thousand plus yards with that superior caliber in a real machine gun. There are zeros out there where you can set it and aim center mass for basically every range, every distance. I still hit center mass. It might not be perfectly center mass. It might be a little bit high on center mass or a little bit low on center mass, but at least gives you a very consistent and easy aiming point. Or some people will set it up so they always aim at the belt buckle, yet always achieve vital hits. Reading the Ranger Handbook as well as some other manuals, it's explicit that it wants you to, to target center base. So you're not going to be firing accidentally over your target. Remember the beaten zone is an average. So most of our rounds are ending here, but some are ending up top. The center of our beaten zone is hitting the actual target. And then the rounds that are landing a little bit closer to us within that beaten zone will be ricocheting and hitting the enemy theoretically jobs. So you've got to know the jobs. So real quick, this is not all inclusive, but the machine gunner is going to be the guy who totes the machine gun, who totes a good chunk of ammo and who pulls the trigger, clears malfunctions, all that kind of stuff responsible for the actual gun. The assistant machine gunner is also going to haul some ammo. They're going to be responsible for bringing a tripod, spare barrel, linking up ammo, giving updates to the machine gunner of where he needs to make micro adjustments and keeping track of ammo consumption so he can relay that to the weasel. Now the weasel is the weapon squad leader. So he's in charge of coordinating everything. He's in charge of setting up where everybody goes with placement. He's going to direct the deployment of each machine gun if he's got multiple in the team. He's going to keep track of the ammo and have it distributed as necessary. He's in control of the rate of fire, which we're going to talk about in a second. He directs talking machine guns when it's time for that and just generally gives commands to the machine gun teams. And just real quick as an example, what the weasel does, we'll watch a quick little video, but he deploys the first machine gun with the bipod. So the bipod gets set up on that berm or whatever they're gonna be firing from. After that, he sends in the tripod for team two, and that gets kind of in the general area and set up where the weasel wants it. And then the team two comes out, then the team two machine gunner comes out and gets set up right onto that tripod. Doesn't mess around with the bipod. Same for team three, the tripod comes out, machine gunner sets up on it, and then after all that's set up and everyone lets the weasel know how everything's going, the team two guy that was on the bipod will switch over to a tripod by his assistant machine gunner and the assistant machine, and the assistant machine gunner will then fold up the bipod and everyone will be set with tripods in position. All right, first call wave one. All right, he's gonna have one AG with tripod and one gun. They're clearing the berm. If there's a threat on that berm, if it's contested berm, they are ready to fight. Weapon squad leader gets eyes on the objective, confirms and pinpoints that this is where he wants to fucking do the killing. Gets one gun on bipod. Bipod signals he's good. Tripod sets his equipment, is ready to receive his next gun. Wave two calls made. Wave two moves up in tandem. Alright, bring your one gun goes straight to tripod, the other one stays on bipod. All right, at this time we are occupied. As soon as we're occupied, we're gonna transition and start working the other gun on the tripod. Now teams could be as small as just a machine gunner and an assistant machine gunner, or they could also have an ammo bitch on the team too, which his job is pretty self-explanatory. So knowing your gear is extremely important. We wanna know the range. What is our max range of that weapon system that we're using? We wanna know what the beaten zone looks like and so we are able to target and put it where we want it with proper coverage. Practice is gonna be key. And we're talking, when we talk about practice, we're talking about setting up, disassembling the weapon, reassembling the weapon, loading the weapon, 
mounting on a tripod, dismounting, moving, communication between the team, barrel changes, malfunction clearing, and team maneuvers. Drill it all over and over again, day and night, because you can't really pick the time sometimes. Especially as a modern Minuteman, we gotta take our opportunities when we get them. Now to substitute for the real thing or in non-permissive environments, we have the options of paintball and airsoft as well. I know it's not the same thing, but it does help you get the movements down and everyone kind of understands their roles and you just practice the theory. Simultaneously on separate days, you are hopefully practicing with live fire with your marksmanship and putting these actual skills to use. Now when everything starts to come together and you get good at team cohesion and you guys are moving together good and flowing together good and your marksmanship is where it should be, everything's working out good, that's when you go do it, IRL, in real life. That's just where you practice with the real tools. Now onto the specific operation of machine guns. We're gonna, the machine gun is not gonna just straight up pin the trigger to the back and just run out of ammo within a couple minutes. That's not smart. That defeats the purpose of a machine gun. You're not going to be able to cover anybody. You're not going to be able to suppress anybody. So we rely on bursts of die, motherfucker, die. Die, motherfucker, die. Die, motherfucker, die. That's how long you hold your burst down. Die, motherfucker, die. That's how that works. And we talked about the squad leader determining the rate of fire that's needed for whatever situation you're in. Unless your life is threatened and you have to fire without getting permission, most of the time, that's where you're going to get your rate of fire from. But if you have to eliminate a threat that's about to kill you, in Minecraft, go ahead and do whatever rate you need to do. But in a controlled, calm, experienced environment where everybody is good to go, the team leader will determine when you start to fire and what rate you select. So a sustained rate is just going to be a four to five second pause in between those die motherfucker dies. Die, motherfucker, die. Like that. Rapid is gonna be two to three seconds pause in between those bursts. And then, and then cyclic, of course, is just gonna be pinning the trigger to the rear until your gun runs out of ammo. In addition to not running out of ammo, another benefit of sustained, especially, but rapid to some extent, is that your assistant gunner is gonna be able to link up more ammo as you go. If you were to do cyclic, you're just going to dump everything you got. And you're also going to work as a human tripod. You're going to spread your legs out wide, you're going to dig your toes down into the ground, and you're going to lean forward and push into that firearm, pushing that gun forward onto the bipod or the front leg of the tripod, and just keeping that slack out of the system. So it's a tight system, you're going to have less movement. Now specifics for the rate of fire say for a 240 Lima, would be as follows. Sustain is gonna be a course of four to five seconds in between, and it's gonna be about 100 rounds per minute. Rapid is gonna be about double that. It's about half the time of rest, so it makes sense that it would be about 200 rounds per minute. And that cyclic is whatever it is for your gun, somewhere around 650, 700 for the 240 Lima. The machine gunners are gonna keep their leader, their weasel, informed of when they're up and when they're down. Now classes of fire in respect to the gun are gonna be traversing. So traversing fire is gonna be side to side. You're not gonna be adjusting with elevation at all. It's just gonna be side to side, just messing with basically windage. Searching is gonna be the opposite. It's gonna be up and down and you're not gonna go side to side. It's gonna be basically elevation, up and down. Now I bet you you could define for me what traverse and search means. My final big note is to remember security. You always need to have someone watching your back. Machine gunners are no exception. Check out my American Fire Team video for that. I kind of briefly cover security and, and sectors of fire and all that, so make sure you check that out. I also recommend the support by fire video that I did. You can kind of see how machine gunners work with an assault team and how everything kind of flows together to win a gunfight. I hope you got something out of the video. It was a long time in the making, but I enjoy doing it. More important is that you got something out of it. So if you did, let me know down in the comments below. Subscribe, share the video because that's the only way this information is going any further than you and me. Freedom takes practice, so go out and practice. Thanks for watching.